I accidentally ate all the pancakes. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Element Church. I want to give a shout out to our St. Charles campus. Everybody watching there in Warrington and online from coast to coast and all over the world. Let's welcome one another to week three of Red Hot Romance. Yeah, just a little bit of a warning. It is going to get a little hot and steamy in here today. How many guys are ready for that? <laughs> yes, uh, I am going to be in the Song of Solomon. It's a, an incredible book. God has a lot to say about this subject since he created this subject. He has a whole book on it called the Song of Solomon. It's a beautiful love song between Solomon and his bride-to-be, the Shulamite, and we're going to learn some very important things from that. Speaking of songs, uh, I love to find interesting song titles and uh, Country music uh, definitely has a lot of interesting song titles. We're going to read a couple of those to you. These are actual country music song titles. Here we go. Uh, I'm so miserable without you, it's almost like having you here. <laughs> You're the reason our kids are so ugly. <laughs> You're the hangnail in my life and I can't bite you off. Actual song titles. And my wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> it's not very hard to see why some of these relationships aren't working out very well. Inside of marriage, what you're going to find is there are wow days. There are just days where you go, wow, you're so beautiful. Wow, you're so attractive. Wow, I can't believe I get to be married to you. Then there's vow days. There's days you look at them and it's not wow, it's whoa. <laughs> you look at them and go, I love you, I just don't like you. I just don't like you right now. And uh, you know, let's be honest, there's days you just go, you're a pain in the ankle. And, and you just have those moments and you hang in there because of the vow that you made. But what the Song of Solomon teaches us is how to put more wow into the days so that you don't just endure marriage as a vow. Yes, there are days you hang in there because you made vows, but the book of Solomon puts the wow back into our marriage. See, falling in love requires a pulse. I mean, you know, young people, oh, we fell in love. Big deal. <laughs> if you fall in love, it's very easy to fall out of love. Falling in love requires a pulse, but staying in love requires a plan. And the Song of Solomon is God's plan. It's his manual that he says, hey, I made this incredible gift of marriage, and I put inside of this incredible gift of marriage an incredible thing that builds intimacy becoming one in soul, one in spirit, and one in body called sex. God invented sex to be an incredible gift inside of marriage. Now, I'm just going to let you know that there's going to be a lot of different reactions about what we're talking about today. If you have zero church background, you didn't grow up in church, and like elements kind of like your first exposure to church, you're probably not going to have any problem with what I say because it's just kind of the world in which you grew up. The world, the world around us, if you notice, they, they're not ashamed to talk about sex. They're trying to talk to your preschooler about sex, and it's incredibly wrong how they're approaching it, right? But if you grew up in a church background, if you grew up in a religious background, this weekend's going to freak you out. Because chances are most churches aren't talking about sex, and if they are talking about sex, it's just don't. Don't do that. We don't, we don't talk about that. And that somehow there's this shame kind of centered around sex, like it's some necessary evil to fill the, fulfill the commandment of be fruitful and multiply. But God knew exactly what he was doing when he created sex. It's not a necessary evil for procreation. God created it so that it would bring pleasure and that it would produce intimacy at the deepest level inside of marriage when it's in the context of how God designed it between a man and a woman, a man 
and a woman in the boundary of marriage. Yeah. See, God, God could have designed procreation anyway. He could have put on the back of a woman's head, push here for baby. <laughs> you want kids? I guess it's about time for kids. <laughs> Whoa, praise God, there's a kid. But no, God designed this to be beautiful expression of love. Now, the Song of Solomon is a love story between uh, Solomon and a Shulamite. And, you know, because she, she's from Shulam, therefore she's the Shulamite. Deep thoughts with Eric. It's about as deep as it gets. And, but it's also another way that we can read this. We can read it from this other perspective and that it's really a manual for us in how we are to build intimacy inside of marriage. But it's also an incredibly beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, the ultimate King of Kings, and his bride, called the church. And so there's times when I just don't really, like, God, could you really love me? Am I really lovable? Am I likable? And I'll just go to the Song of Solomon, and I'll just read it from the perspective of how God feels about me, how Jesus feels about me. So different ways you can approach it. Now, this book, which is about romance, which is about sex, which is about conflict, conflict resolution, is so steamy and so graphic that a Jewish male wasn't allowed to read it until he was 30 years of age. All, all the high schoolers are running home right now to go, dude, we're going to have a Bible study in the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Let's have adult supervision. Okay. Now, uh, chapter four in the Song of Solomon is about the consummation of their wedding night. And it, it's, it, it's a beautiful, uh, and it's very graphic, and it's very detailed in chapter four. It's all about the bedroom on the wedding night. And so how many go, let's get to chapter four. <laughs> Guys, come on, don't leave me hanging here, men. How many go chapter four, pastor? Let's get to the bedroom. Now, I do gotta let you know that before great sex happens in the bedroom, there's three chapters. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, before chapter four. We wanna go right to chapter four. But God says there's three chapters ahead of it. And I'm going to tell you what it's called. And you've probably never heard this word in church. This is going to shock you. You want a great chapter four? Then you need great foreplay in chapter one, two, and three. <laughs> it's why I told you to put your kid in kids' church, people. Don't email me. I'm not even going to read it. All right. Now. Foreplay, guys, before you play, there's what comes before, before you play. That's why it's called foreplay. <laughs> foreplay to the man, hey, want to have sex? That's not foreplay. That's just stupid. I don't understand why my wife's never in the mood. Because you didn't read chapter one, two, and three. <laughs> now, for a man, ladies, foreplay is really simple. Men are very, very simple to understand. In fact, I, I have a diagram. Shield your, your young children's eyes. I have a diagram on how to turn your man on. Here we go, right here. That's it. It's a light switch. That's called foreplay for a man. Two steps, two steps, okay? Ladies, show up. Step one. Step two, get naked. That's it. There you go. Great biblical intimacy. Now, ladies, slightly more complex. God designed the woman this way on purpose. It's not an accident. It's intentional. Can we just, I got, I got a diagram here for you too, guys, uh, but we just need a moment of silence for this. Can we just kind of mentally, emotionally prepare Jesus? Just help us? Okay. Here we go. This is a woman when it comes to foreplay. <laughs> now, all right, a little more complicated. <laughs> now, here's the good news. One of these buttons is gonna turn her on. Now, nobody knows which one it is. She doesn't know which one it is. She'll know when you hit it, but nobody knows. Chances are, it's the last or second to last one that you're going to go through to find. Now, you're thinking, that's great. I just got to go find it. But here's the problem. 
you find it today, it'll be entirely different tomorrow. <laughs> it will constantly be changing and rotating around that board. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about where great sex starts. It doesn't start in the bedroom. It actually would start more appropriately in the morning in front of the bathroom mirror because what we see is women struggle with what they tend to see in the mirror. And we actually see this in chapter one where the Shulamite is dealing with the insecurity that she feels about herself and her need for affirmation. So we see in Song of Solomon chapter one, verse six, do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. So she is feeling ashamed because her skin and complexion is overly dark because she was out having to work and her hands are probably rough. So she has this low self-esteem and she's concerned about how the king is going to feel about her. Now, there's a picture of this for us because this is about us and our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, many of us feel ashamed. We're embarrassed because we've been out laboring under the sun uh, in terms of sin and we have issues issues in our life, and we're ashamed that God is not going to accept us, that he's going to see the blemishes of our life. But what Solomon does is what every man needs to do for his wife and what Jesus Christ does for us, his church. He doesn't talk about how she sees herself. He sees her in an entirely different way. He comes back with words of affirmation. Every woman needs words of affirmation. So he says this in verse nine, and then there's more, and I jumped to verse 15. He says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Now, let's talk about context. Don't go calling your wife a horse. <laughs> but apparently in that day, that was romantic. Today, you're gonna get killed. When your wife is brought before the court, right, and they're bringing accusations of murder against her, the defense attorney is going to say, hey, he called her a horse. Judge is going to go, oh, okay, makes sense. You're free to go. <laughs> All right. Oh, how beautiful are your eyes as doves. So he gives words of affirmation. Ladies uh, tend to struggle with this area more than men. In fact, statistics show uh, that 80% of women struggle with the low self-esteem. And it's one of the one, number one causes of suicide among young girls is just a sense of I'm not pretty enough, I, I'm not good enough, and I can't live up to all these expectations of the cover girl models. Hey, cover girl models don't look like cover girl models because they had to do art and brush up on Photoshop on the model. Nobody looks like that, okay? Now, men don't tend to struggle with this quite as much as women. You know, you don't see most men laboring in front of the mirror. Getting ready for a man, it's a five-minute deal. We walk in front of the mirror, we go, looks good. <laughs> we kind of just tend, you know, to look there and just go, aren't you blessed to have all this? <laughs> and as we get older, all of this. <laughs> like, our self-perception rarely changes. <laughs> I'm just so glad God kind of made us ignorant about ourselves, man. It's just God's gift to us. If we really knew how ugly we were, we would implode. <laughs> but women tend to struggle with this more. And so, you know, they're in the mirror and they're like, oh my gosh. And they're putting on war paint and carbondo and they're trying to patch everything up. And this is where we as men have a responsibility to come in and take care of the garden of our wife. See, God gave Adam a responsibility, and that was to tend the garden. The garden, God wasn't quite as concerned about plants. The spiritual imagery is that the wife is the ultimate garden that the man is to tend. Adam was told, have dominion. That's not dominating the wife, but the dominion was to be exercised over creeping things. It's a man's job to protect his marriage from creeps. And one way you protect your marriage is by overwatering your wife with words. 
Your words cause your wife to flourish. When you get up and you affirm her and you love her, baby, you're so fine. Mm, 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 mm. You're the sugar in my Kool-Aid. And like, you just speak words of affirmation over her. It waters her soul. It affirms her. It cleanses her. Your wife is to be a beautiful flower like this. And your words over her, your words of romance, your words of love, cause your wife to bloom and blossom. Now, you might be going, yeah, dude, but my wife, she's this. She's all prickly. She's all cactusy. I ain't getting none of that over there. I'm getting that. Now, let's unpack that for a minute. That might be your wife right now. She might be a cactus. You try to give her a hug, you get, hey, baby. Now, where do cactuses grow? Deserts. What's rare inside of a desert? Water. And because water is rare in a desert, every animal coming by knows that there's water inside of a plant, so they're gonna eat the plant. So the pricklies are the defense mechanism to keep the plant alive from being devoured because everybody wants what little water's in there. Often when a wife is prickly and... Pokely, new word. <laughs> it's a self-defense mechanism. There's a self-protective thing there. And what she's really crying out for is water. Your words of affirmation and love and affection water your wife's soul. You could take that cactus and you can drown it in love and see it change into a beautiful flower once again. But men, that's your job. Ladies, get out your phones, text to give an extra love offering right now, because that was good. Am I right? Is that, is that what you all want? Woo! Yeah. Boo, yeah. Text to give. You spell thousand, T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. All right. Uh, my sister, Heather Bunch, she struggled with uh, a lot of self-esteem growing up. And uh, I come to find out, uh, I actually caused a lot of it as her older brother. <laughs> and, uh, but she has had an incredible journey of overcoming uh, self-esteem, overcome a lot of different challenges a lot of ladies go through. And she recently wrote a book that is available out at all our campuses, out in the, in the, the cafe. She's actually here at this campus this weekend signing that book. And I wanted to let you know, ladies, uh, I'm not endorsing this book because she's my sister. I'm endorsing this book because it's truly an incredible book to help you uh, in this area of self-esteem. Uh, my sister uh, used to work for me back in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I was at at Church on the Move. Uh, she was uh, one of our team members there. And her and her husband, Bob, were the very first people uh, when I was getting ready to move up to St. Louis. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm moving to St. Louis, starting a church. They said, we're helping. And they were the first people to move here to help us plant this church. She was on our staff for over 16 years in a variety of different roles. She has a lot of great things to say. So ladies, you will be blessed by this book. So be sure to pick that up. Wanted to give you that resource. I want to show you Ephesians chapter five, how the words of Jesus nourish our soul just as a husband's words nourish his wife's. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Notice that his words have a cleansing effect upon us to present her to himself as a radiant church. Jesus takes responsibility for how his bride looks. He understands that we are a radiant reflection of the light that he shines upon us without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless in the same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Jesus takes responsibility for the condition of his bride and how his bride looks. Men, we need to take responsibility for what is being shown inside of our life. There's an Old Testament picture for this New Testament principle, and that is in the life of Joseph. Joseph has a dream where the sun, the moon, and the stars, which represent his brothers, are all bowing down to him in respect. Well, he shares this dream with his dad, and his dad rebukes him, and here's why. His dad understands that the sun would be dad, the moon is the mother, and the stars are the brother. Why? Because a moon does not give off its own light, it simply reflects the light of the sun. And the biblical principle is what we just read here in Ephesians, that the church of itself has no natural light. 
The light is the reflection of Jesus Christ, the Son, S-U-N, that we reflect through him. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he goes on to say, and you're the light of the world. It's not that we have light. It's the light of Jesus Christ that reflects through us. Men, if you look at your wife and you don't like what you see, change what you're sending. Because the wife ultimately reflects the man. Ladies, you can text to give again. There's no law against texting twice to give. All right. Now, we're going to move from the bathroom mirror to more foreplay, and that is in the kitchen. This is where the foreplay should be heating up. This is where it should get a little bit better. Now, I see we got some note takers here. So, uh, and a lot of people, because you've never written that word down inside a church. You have never wrote the word foreplay in notes in church. I'm going to help you spell it because many of you don't even know how to spell it. So here we go. Foreplay. R-O-M-A-N-C-E. Foreplay. Okay, I'm going to say it again. R-O, capital M, capital A, capital N, lowercase C-E. Romance. Romance is the foreplay to a great chapter four. And that's what we see. Romance. Now, what is the root word of romance? I just said it, people. It was capital letters. M-A-N. What's the root of romance? Man. Man, Man, it's your job to romance your woman. It's our job. It's our responsibility to romance. So I'm going to help you guys, and I'm going to just give you some practical I'm going to do some play-by-plays of romance. Play-by-play, foreplay in the morning. Here's what it looks like. Your wife may be standing at the counter, at the sink. Maybe she's cooking. Here we go. Cover your kid's eyes. Here we go. You walk up to her. Put your arms around her up top here, up, and go, hey, baby. I just want to let you know how beautiful you look. You're so fine. Oh, you just, and you just say some nice things and you talk about how beautiful and attractive she is. Here's the key. This is, this is where we blow it. Walk away. <laughs> this, this is the part we struggle with. Walk away. Just walk away. Now, you're waiting. You're hunting. You're a hunter. So you're going to look for the next opportunity. You're going to come up. You're going to hug her, and you're going to just say something romantic, like, hey, baby, can I pray over you? Guys, you, you, you want to get to chapter four faster? This is the fast pass <laughs> to chapter four, and that is pray over your wife. Seriously, nothing looks sexier to your wife than you praying over her and not praying, dear God, let me have sex. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> praying over your wife a blessing. Lord, I thank you that I've been blessed with this incredible woman. I'm so honored that you've entrusted me with such a precious gift in my wife. I just bless her today. I pray Psalm 91 over her safety and protection. God, I just bless her today. Now, walk away. (laughs) So this is where we blow it. We don't know how to walk away. Number three, you do that a third time? Now, She's going to start, you're getting close to one of those buttons. You do that a third time in some way where you just hug her in a non-sexual affectionate touch. She, she might, you might hear the engine. You, you might, she might. Here's the deal. Walk away. You leave her wanting more. You've never done that before. Try it. It's powerful. It's effective. Walk away. I like what one guy calls it. He calls it slow roasting your woman. (laughs) You just slow roast her all day. It's a 24 hour deal, maybe 48 hour, 72, a week, whatever. You just slow roast. (laughs) So, men, every woman is different 
and what they find romantic and what they find attractive. Every woman is different. So this means you're going to have to study her. But you, you're okay because you do this all the time. You study how to hunt deer. You study how to fix the engine under the hood of the car. If you put that same energy into getting into the hood of her heart, she might purr a little bit more for you. Study your wife. Solomon studies the Shulamite woman, this woman that he loves. How beautiful you are, my darling. Your eyes behind the veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Probably don't say that. That, again, is some context to culture of the day. Not quite sure. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of comparisons, apparently, out there. Today, we might say you're like a, the peanut in my Snickers bar, the peanut butter in my Reese's cup. They had goats. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming from the washing. Not one of them is alone. Now, <laughs> now <laughs> they didn't have dentistry like we have. <laughs> so, a woman with all her teeth, that was a catch. Now, I'm not a theologian, but I do know this. This woman went from Arkansas. <laughs> Love you out there in Arkansas. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Your lips are like scarlet ribbons. Your mouth is lovely. And I notice this. He starts at the top and works his way down. Men, one of the most important things you can do for your wife is to look into her eyes, not the rest of her. Because men tend to go other places. Look at your wife. When you talk to her, look in her eyes. Because the eyes are the gateway to the soul. Jesus says that. And so when you're looking into her and you're saying romantic things, be looking in her eyes because you're looking into her soul and you're telling her how much you love her and how wonderful she is. Ladies, is that true? Do you appreciate that? You like that? Good. Now, this is going to require work for us as men because this doesn't necessarily come natural for us. So we are going to have to work to study our wives. Uh, you know, I don't need to study my woman. I, I've been with her 25 years. You know, when your wife says something to you like, baby, do you still love me? She's not asking for information. Well, woman, you know I love you. Told you 25 years ago. I changed my mind, I'll let you know. That's not, that's, not, that's not what she's looking for. That's information. What she's looking for is affirmation, okay? So, you need to continually have to study her and what continually affirms her. So here's a quick little test to see how well you know your wife. Look at me, all the men. Everybody look at here. Men, there, look at me, okay. What is your wife wearing right now? Don't look. You're clueless. You have no clue. Uh, clothes? That's not an answer. What colors her shoes, her outfit, her purse? earrings, all that. You don't know. You're clueless. Why? Because we're men. We, we tend to be clueless. We're really good at that. So you have to study her. Men, here's some great things. Like when your wife's getting ready to walk out, look at what she's wearing. Hey, baby, I love those shoes today. It goes with, oh, thank you. <laughs> now, in order to know what your wife finds romantic, you're going to have to study, and you're going to have to ask her some questions. I want to give you a resource, which is a great book. I'm not going to give it to you. You can buy it, or you can go online and download this test for free. But it's called uh, The Five Love Languages, uh, and these are really, really powerful and been proven to be uh, accurate. There's five ways in which we tend to feel love and give love. Now, we feel love through all those, but they're in an ascending, descending order in terms of priority, meaning you tend to feel loved by your top two more than the rest. And so there's acts of service. That means, you know, doing things for somebody, uh, receiving gifts, giving gifts, quality time together, words of affirmation, physical touch. I've been very blessed because my number one love language is touch. And my wife's number one love language is touch. Yeah, I'm, every man hates me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was gone for two weeks before I, uh, this message. You know what I was doing? I was practicing what I preach. <laughs> Woo! Boo, 
Oh, yeah. Next week, chapter four. We're going to get there. I've, I've been doing a lot of foreplay for two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> all right. So, all right, man. I want to talk to you for a second. You have to ask your wife what she finds romantic. Get that book. Go through it. You'll find a lot of great dialogue. But ladies, we need two things from you. Two things. You're not going to text to give on this one. But your husband is. Get your phone ready, man. Here we go. When your husband asks you, what, what's romantic to you? What, what gets you excited? What, what charges you emotionally? You have to tell them. Because women don't want to tell their man. Because here's what you, if he loved me, he'd just know. No. We don't know. Like, and you're, and you're talking to your guy and he gets that blank look on his face and you're offended that he's got a blank look on his face. Like, don't look at me like plain stupid. No, this is a real look. <laughs> this is kind of like a natural look. We're not even acting. Like this is, actually, we look this way a lot. Because we, this is, this is it. So tell him. But if he loved me, he'd know. We don't know. If we know, we would do. Well, actually, okay, second thing. <laughs> Women, you want us to not only know how to read your mind, which... That is a long-held myth, ladies. We cannot read your mind. Say it again. We cannot read your mind. Now, women not only want us to know, you want us to actually want to do what you want. We don't. <laughs> so when you tell your man, I find it incredibly romantic when you do the dishes. If he wanted to do the dishes, he would have been doing it already. The reason he doesn't do them is because he doesn't want to. So women somehow give us less points when we're doing what we don't want to do, but we know you want us to do it. So a man's in there doing the dishes. Hey, baby, I'm doing the dishes. Big deal. I could see that you're not very excited about it. <laughs> And if you really loved me, you would really enjoy this right now. I'd rather have shards of glass in my eyes. What are you talking about? But I'm doing it. Look, Pastor Leo talked about this last week. He talked about the different boxes. And all men's favorite box is the nothing box. Look, our whole goal in life is to get back to nothing. We want to get back to doing nothing. We love nothing. Nothing is the best. We're going to come out for sex, and then we want to get back to nothing <laughs> as soon as we can. So, look, when your husband does for you what you know he doesn't like to do, it's not like 50% credit. It's 200%. It's bonus credit because true love is he's laying down what he wants for you. That's true love. Like, I got, I got guy friends, they love to cook, and they're really good at cooking. I go, big deal. You get no brownie points. I don't care how good your cooking is with your wife. You enjoy that. That ain't love. That's you loving you. When I cook, that's brownie points. I'm good at cooking three things, Cap'n Crunch, <laughs> mac cheese and a grilled cheese sandwich. That's it, man. So my wife knows that when I'm flipping a grilled cheese sandwich, and here's the thing, she knows when I'm flipping it. Hey, baby, I'm cooking you a grilled cheese sandwich. I let her, I let her know. I, 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 hate, I, hate, I hate cleaning. Like I just, I go, I'm just gonna pay somebody to do that. I, I got better things to do. My nothing box is way better than cleaning. I'm gonna get back in there. So like, so when my wife, if she's out and I cleaned anything, this is, this is what it's like. Oh, hey, baby, welcome back. Hey, hey, I'm gonna show you something. Come here, come here, come here. You're like this. Uh, see, you had this, this laundry basket that you didn't have time to fold. I, 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 I folded it. Me, me, I folded it. It's here on the bed. Uh, I didn't know where it went. <laughs> but, but it's here. <laughs> You're probably going to have to refold all of it. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but hey, come here, come here, come here. This trash can, I emptied it. 
I, I just put it over in the other one, but, but I emptied it. And I get bounty points because she knows I hate to do it. Ladies, if your man's doing for you what you know he hates, it's gonna be a good night eventually. Reward him. Here's a great principle. Here's a great principle. No other service got this. This is free because nobody wanted to pay for it. <laughs> Here's a great principle. People repeat what you reward. People repeat what you reward. So ladies, your guy is gonna make an attempt at what I've just taught. And you need to reward that no matter how pathetic it looks. Because it is gonna be, because he's not been practicing. You need to reward it like, oh, baby, that was almost a good thing you did. Oh, so proud of you. Like, you reward it. I I did good. Yeah, you did good. And he will keep trying and he'll get better. You reward it. Don't go, it's about time. Well, that wasn't as good as Pastor Eric said. Don't ever pull me into your fights, ever. I will leave you hanging. Don't ever pull me in there. I'm in my nothing box. (laughs) John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. What would it look like if we would die to ourselves and our wants to prefer our wife? Ladies, what would it look like if we would die to ourselves and our wants to take care of our husband's needs? The perfect marriage is when both couples are laying down their lives for one another. And the more we do that, and the more often we do that, the more we can stay in chapter four in the bedroom. (laughs) How many are ready for chapter four? Yeah, woo, next week. You gotta come back and bring a friend. (laughs) Next week, chapter four. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you that Jesus, the King of Kings, loved us so much that he left heaven to come and hang on a cross to die for our sins and rose from the dead to save us. Lord, we were scarred by sin. We were blemished, truly unlovable, but you loved us because you're love. Lord, thank you that the ultimate act of love was you paid for our sins. You rose from the dead. You're seated at the right hand of God the Father and one day you're coming back for your bride, church. I pray for anyone that doesn't know Christ, anyone who hasn't experienced the gift of salvation, that today you would draw them with your love and grace. You can ask for a moment, every head bowed, every eye closed there, St. Charles, Warrington online. If you don't know this Jesus, he's simply a prayer away. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. Nobody will ever love you more than you've been loved by Christ. He can bring his love inside of your life with this prayer. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. He's simply a prayer away. I'd love to lead you in that prayer today. Maybe you've known Christ, but you've just wandered. You've drifted. You're away from God. Maybe you don't know if you're saved. You've been around church. You've been religious, but you can't pinpoint a moment that you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Today could be the day that you know that you know you accepted the gift of salvation through Jesus. I wanna lead you in that prayer. We love you, we believe in you. We're we're gonna join in, we're all gonna say this prayer together out loud. Church, let's say this. Jesus, thank you that even though I was unlovable, you first loved me. You left heaven to come to this earth, to hang on that cross, to pay the price for all my sins. You rose from the dead for me. I invite you to be my savior and to be my Lord. I surrender my life to follow you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Church, let's give him a big hand clap. Amen. Well, if you just said that prayer,